Lord, your promise is that, that if we humble ourselves, you will do the exalting that needs to be done. And we do want to come and humble ourselves before you. Just simply coming and acknowledging who you are, your ways much, much higher than our ways, your thoughts beyond our understanding. And we come and humble ourselves before you and just worship you. We really pray, Lord, that you would be glorified, you would be well pleased. We would be able to, in some way, bless you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Amen.
Stand in the midst of a multitude of those from every tribe and tongue. We are your people, redeemed by your blood, rescued from death by your
Father, again we humble ourselves before you and before your word, before your truth. And it's only in that humility that you can really speak to us. And so we do pray that if there's anything of that pride, anything that would stand between us and you, would you show us, would you deal with that right now? That we may be humble enough for you to speak to us and to show us in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of, the, of God lives forever. What an amazing little expression that is. The boastful pride of life, the New American Standard. It's, it's one word, but that word means boastful pride. The boastful pride of life. It just so wonderfully sums up everything we see around us. Probably what we also ourselves are often guilty of. That horrible thing. The boastful pride of life. And John says very specifically that this pride is totally of the world. And he says that we show that we love the world when we are guilty of that boastful pride of life. And if we do that, then the love of the Father is very clearly not in us. Last Saturday was Heritage Day, and Saturday morning I went to Howick, parked in the main street. As I was pulling in, the scruffiest, dirtiest guy, with a few little remaining shed, uh, shreds of a car guard bib, comes running from 200 meters away, comes running down the road, and he stands next to my car. So I said to him very politely, I don't need a car guard, thank you very much. He says to me, why not? <laughs> so I said, my car is just absolutely fine, it can look after itself. So then this filthy man 
but amazingly, astonishingly, astonishingly full of the boastful pride of life. He says to me, so what's your problem? Are you a racist? And, and right then, the love of the Father was nowhere to be found in me. <laughs> I got very, very angry, and I said to him in Zulu, I said, you've run past 20 cars full of Zulu people, and you didn't stop and offer your service to any of them, but you've run up to the only white man in the street, and then you still have the nerve to call me a racist. And I did actually say foot sack as well. But, <laughs> but as I thought about it afterwards, it just appalled me that I had so quickly responded to the boastful pride of life in that man. And I'd responded with an even bigger dose of the boastful pride of life. And that right then, there was not a shred of the love of the Father to be found in me. And, and in verse 17, John makes another incredible statement. He says, all of this is going to pass away. But the person who does just one thing will abide forever. And that one thing, he says, is simply doing the will of the Father. The one who does the will of the Father will abide forever. And the heart of the will of the Father is found right in this passage. Do not love the things of the world. And very specifically, don't walk in the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and that boastful pride of life. And so it really boils down, that passage boils down to a command to walk in holiness and humility. Pride is the great killer disease of mankind. And if pride is the sickness, then obviously humility is the cure. Many, many times in Scripture, God commands us. He says, you humble yourself. Ezra 8, 21. Jeremiah 13, verse 8. James 4, verse 10. 1 Peter 5, verse 6. And of course, 1 Chronicles 17, 14. If my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves... And if they pray and they seek my face, and if they turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. And then a number of others we could go to as well. And, and obviously pride manifests itself in many different shapes and forms. But I believe one of the main ways in which pride shows itself both in the world and in the church, is in one thing, and that is in independence. Independence. The world's great war cry, I did it my way. Independence. And if pride is seen in independence, then humility will be seen in dependence. And our great de example of dependence, of course, is Jesus himself. He chose of his own free will to live here on earth a life of total dependence on the Father. All the time making it perfectly clear that the Son can do nothing of himself. Many times Jesus said, I only speak what I hear the Father speak. I only do what the Father tells me to do. John 5:19. Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. And Jesus' life here on earth was of a voluntary dependence upon the Father all the way through to the cross. That was the mark of his true humility. In Jesus, we see no pride expressing itself in independence, but perfect humility shown through absolute dependence. And so one of the main things we see 
in the true church of Jesus Christ should be humility. It should be the main hallmark of the church. And how is that humility expressed? Through dependence, through dependence on God and even dependence on one another. That's why the out of church movement is such an abomination. When someone says, well, I'm a Christian, I just don't go to church anymore. He's just saying one thing. I'm full of pride. Doesn't matter how nice the person is or how good the reasons may seem. Any Christian who's not regularly attending a local church has one problem only. Pride. People will say, well, I used to go to church, but I got hurt. What got hurt? Your pride. And the man God mainly used to give us his pattern for the church is himself such an incredible example of humility. We see Saul of Tarsus, a man who has every single worldly justification to be proud. He says, if anyone had reason to be confident in the flesh, it was me. And he lists all those reasons. But later we see in the Apostle Paul things like 2 Corinthians 10 verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I'm pleading with you by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. Ephesians 4.2 With all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing one another in love. And God's purposes for His church had first been worked out in this man who just once been overflowing with that boastful pride of life. And it's not enough for Paul to be given a revelation of the church and then to go out and do some lectures about the revelation he'd got. Paul had to be taken hold of and made an example, a living example of the revelation God had given him. The Holy Spirit brings the man who is the message and then begins to deal with that man to show you what the church is, what the church is in that man. So that what you find in Paul are the very principles in the church. The Lord takes up the cross and hammers Paul hammering away at all the pride, breaking it, and then bringing out in this man's life this incredibly beautiful humility. Saul of Tarsus is a man of independence, great independence, of judgment, of purpose, of mind, of will, of way, all of it part of the human nature. But as we read the epistles, we see a man who has been smitten and smitten and smitten by the Lord, who is steadily moving all the time to a place of utter dependence on God, until you meet Paul where he confesses his utter and complete dependence on the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul attributes everything to the Lord and says he's utterly dependent on the Lord for all strength and all life, all wisdom, all understanding, Everything. And that keeps a man very humble. When you know that you have to rely on God for everything. True absence of pride is marked by that one thing. An utter dependence on God. And what is the one of the greatest features of dependence on the Lord? Prayerfulness. Prayerfulness. A prayerless life is a life which has never yet recognized its dependence on God. A life of prayer is a life which has come to see that it cannot go anywhere without the Lord. The Lord could very easily do everything that He wants to do without us ever asking. God could just simply go and do it all. But he has ordained prayer as his way of working and of meeting our needs. Prayer 
is our way of showing that we are dependent on God. Prayer is your greatest way of showing that you are dependent on the Lord and you need the Lord. If you look at, again at Paul's revelation of the church, the body of Christ, you'll see how he lays down these principles of dependence, interdependence, mutual dependence, and how he strikes strong blows against anything in terms of independence and separatedness. The body is one. No member of the body can say to one another, I have no need of you. Every member must say, I am dependent on you. The hand can't take the place of the foot, and so on. The whole body is constituted to demonstrate the law of dependence. That is humility. Pride is also shown in possessiveness, taking hold of things to rule over them, to possess them. It's the work of Adam and it's in all of us. It's shown in the desire to be in control, to have under our own hand, under our own influence. It's a terrible thing. And the ruin of the church has often come through independent men and women wanting to take charge, wanting to possess other people, wanting to influence other people. It's the ruin of the church. It was the ruin of the race. It was the ruin of Satan himself. And there's nothing like that about the Lord Jesus Christ. His was a, just a letting go unto the Father all the time. Listen to what he says. All that the Father gives me shall come to me. No fret about that. No strain. No hurried, feverish, excitable rushing around to try and get members of his church, to get people to join, to make a success of things. All that the Father gives me shall come. Just a letting go to the Father. And that is faith. That is not passivity. But it is absolute faith in the Father. It is our inborn desire to have a sphere, a sphere of power, of influence, of domination that causes us to try to get something, to get hold of something, to possess it, to see something, to have something, to see the work grow, to see success. And there was nothing of that in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a mark of the true house of God when there's no strain to possess for the sake of possession, to have power, to have mastery, to hold something. That's mine, don't touch it, it's mine. And the Lord Jesus had nothing in himself of that. And he wanted nothing for himself. His attitude was, Father, if you want me to have that, you will give it to me. That is the attitude of Christ. And that is how the Lord builds his church or any work of his. We must be very careful that our natural possessiveness doesn't come up in the things of the Lord. It works unconsciously, even in our desire for something like spiritual blessing. We always need to be very, very sure of our motives when we ask God for some blessing or desire even some particular gift. Is it to possess something in order, in order that having hold it and laid hold of it, we can have some greater influence, we can have more, we can be recognized? Even a desire for holiness can sometimes have a, a very subtle snare to it. That if we're holy, people will notice that we're holy. And it will be said of us, there's a holy man or a holy woman. And one of the great evidences of humility is just self-emptying. Paul said to the Corinthians in an ironical way, you are full. You've reigned as kings without us. He says, we are accounted as the offscouring of all things. 
but you are full. Isn't that amazing? And just look at what Jesus said to the church at Laodicea. Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched and miserable, poor and blind and naked. That's the apostate church. We've got it all. Big buildings, great programs, successful everything. We just don't need Jesus anymore. We are independent. And there is an emptiness which brings much glory to God. And hu humility is all about being poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. God dwells with such as are of, of a broken and contrite spirit. God-centeredness is the absolute opposite of self-centeredness. That all our wellsprings, all our resources, our everything is in the Lord. And all our interests are in the Lord. The house of God should be a place of humility, dependence, emptiness, God-centeredness. It should be a place filled with the grace of God. God resists the proud, but God gives grace to the humble. And if pride leads to death, then humility, what Paul calls the meekness of Christ, leads to life. Incredible, eternal, wonderful life. And what's it that marks Jesus in the book of Revelation? I think when we think of Jesus in the book of Revelation, we think of him on the white horse and as a mighty warrior. No. Christ, the lamb who has been slain. And it's the lamb who overcomes. What is a lamb? A lamb is the epitome of dependence. In itself, nothing. And if we really are going to be a dwelling place of God, what will God have to do to get us there? He'll have to destroy our independence, empty us of our self-sufficiency, bring us to the place where we have nothing in ourselves and are all in Him. Pride. All the things aligned to it like arrogance, presumption, Haughtiness, jealousy, envy, unforgiveness, pride. Or true kingdom humility that doesn't even know how humble it really is. Years ago I read a book by Jamie Buckingham. And in it he told how he was preaching at, at a particular meeting. Just before he was due to speak, the person running the meeting said there's going to be a special musical item. Two old men got up to sing, one playing a guitar, one playing a banjo, which only had three of its five strings left, both instruments horribly out of tune. One started singing lead and the other tenor, then they decided to change parts. Then they started the song a third time with them both singing tenor. Halfway through the song, another banjo string broke, and the old boy playing the banjo was so upset by this that he began singing another completely different song. Jamie Buckingham said he could hardly believe what he was hearing. And he was horrified at the thought of then having to stand up and speak after this lot. Then the Lord began to speak to him and said, you, you, you think that sounds pretty awful, don't you? And he said, oh God, yes, you know how bad it is. It really is terrible. And then the Lord said, would you like to know what I think about it? The Lord asked gently. Jamie Buckingham said, I had the feeling that I'd ventured into an area where I had absolutely no business being. 
And he said he knew God was going to tell him what he thought, whether he wanted to hear it or not. And God spoke to him and said, these are two of my choicest saints. They stand and they sing knowing their voices are cracked and their instruments out of tune because they love me. They are singing to my glory and I have commanded all the angels in heaven to be quiet so I can hear them. And then the Lord said to him, you were judging them by worldly standards while I was judging them by kingdom standards. You were listening to how they sang. I was listening to why they were singing. Jamie Buckingham then went on to say, if two old men with cracked voices and out-of-tune instruments can cause God to tell the angels to keep quiet, then the rest of us had better do some deep checking of our reasons for singing, playing, preaching, writing, publishing, earning money, or anything else that we so glibly claim to be doing for the Lord. You know, for me, one of the greatest mysteries of God, outside of some of the mysteries in Scripture, it's always a man called Evan Roberts. As many of you know, Evan Roberts was the man used by God in the great Welsh revival, the early 1900s, where in the space of just over a year, hundreds of thousands of people were saved. And incredibly, when they checked up years later, the vast, vast majority of them stayed saved. The great temptation today would be to say, well, we must take this revival all around the world. Evan Roberts must go and do a worldwide tour and, and have revival meetings all over the place. But just over a year after the revival started, Evan Roberts was reported to have had a nervous and physical breakdown. And then he spent the rest of his life in absolute obscurity, just shut away. And everything I've read about Evan Roberts has always painted a picture of this poor, broken, useless man who was used by God for a very short season, but then had a blowout and even became controlled by a horrible woman called Jesse Penn Lewis. That awful homosexual man, Roberts Lee Arden, who wrote a book called God's Generals, even had the nerve to call Jesse Penn Lewis Jezebel. There's a subtitle in that book that says, Enter Jezebel. And the, that Roberts Lee Arden, by the way, was exposed as a homosexual down the road. But, anyway. but Evan Roberts, never heard of again. What a shame. Over the years I prayed and I said, Lord, what, what really happened to that man? Why did you allow that to happen? You could have used him so mightily to bring revival to the whole, wor whole world. Did you give up on him? Did you desert him? And you know, if you ask God with a sincere heart, he will always answer you eventually. Evan Roberts and Jesse Penn Lewis wrote a book called War on the Saints, probably the best book on spiritual warfare ever written. If you've got the grace to read it, it's about that thick. And for a number of years, they published a magazine called The Overcomer. One day I came across the transcripts from the very last issue of that magazine that they did, published at the end of 1914. They closed the magazine, even though at the time it was very successful, but they closed it because God said it's time to close it. And this is what was written about Evan, Rich, uh, Evan Roberts in this final issue, and I'm giving you the, the shortened version. Evan Roberts heard the call to prayer in the autumn of 1904. But when the unexpected happened, and he found himself on a tide carrying him, carrying him into public ministry, so the call to prayer for the time being sunk into abeyance. What happened to Evan Roberts' high call to pray? The Welsh revival interrupted it. The call to prayer came back suddenly one day in the spring of 1907. He'd been praying for two hours or more, and when the time of prayer was over, a drawing to prayer came again. And he said to himself, if I obey this call, I shall be always praying. 
He followed that draw to prayer, and he discovered a spring opened in his spirit out of which came a prayer stream full of unction. He felt God calling him to stand in the gap on behalf of the church. The demon hosts of hell had swept upon the church, awakened in the revival, and truly there was no man who clearly realized the danger and to stand in the gap before the Lord with ha and hands uplifted like Moses against the unseen foes while Israel battled on the plain. If I do not turn it into prayer, I may lose it, he would say. And so gradually his whole being was shut up in the service of prayer. It took his whole time. It became the one engagement and the one claim of his life. He was living in another world, occupied with service in the unseen realm. And therefore he could only have his spirit and mind free for outer things when God released him from prayer through having nothing else to pray for. And I'm still quoting from the magazine. This prayer work has lasted without intermission for seven years at the time of, of writing. Because even at night he fell asleep praying and awoke in the morning with a spirit and mind alert for dealing with God. In deep spiritual isolation the work was done. With a crucifixion of the personal life that few could endure or understand. Alone and misjudged, his work not understood, the faithful intercessor plowed on. Willpower alone would not have enabled this prayer laborer to hold on year after year, with all outer things, both painful and pleasant, made subservient to the call. Others saw and bore witness to the divine source of his prayers, no human mind could have conceived them, for they were divinely inspired, as if his spirit was in constant communion with God, catching his mind concerning men and things long before they reached the outer world. The outstanding characteristic which overshadows all others in Evan Roberts is his manifest anchor within the veil, the inevitable result of a life of perpetual prayer. Prayer, he says, is a definite transaction with God, a committal to Him of everything as it arises. And once committed or prayed over, that thing, whether it be work of demons or sin of men, untoward circumstances or personal trouble, is transferred to God to deal with according to His will. Let any believer live like this for years, and there will come upon him the stamp of the eternal. Impetuous speech and action will subside. The fever of haste in manner and gait will pass away. End of the quote from the magazine. So you have the world's perspective on Evan Roberts. What a waste. What a tragedy that this great man of God broke down and got led astray by Jezebel. Shame. Write him off. And you have heaven's perspective. A man anchored within the veil, locked up with God for at that time seven years and who knows how many more after that. Someone asked him many years later, what have you been doing all these years? Evan Roberts answered with one short sentence, I have been praying the prayer of the kingdom. You see, Evan Roberts never lost the anointing to preach. He just simply chose to listen to God's higher call. In 1928, his father died, and at the funeral, people were doing all the normal long eulogies. Evan Roberts eventually stood up and interrupted all the rituals, and he spoke 14 words. This is not death but a resurrection. Let us bear witness to this truth. One of the people at the funeral said something like electricity went through us. One felt that if he had gone on, there would have been a revival then 
and there. He hadn't lost the anointing to preach. He had just made a choice. And what was it about Evan Roberts that brought heaven greater joy? 18 months of Welsh revival or years anchored alone within the veil with God while the world outside gossiped and maligned, got angry, misjudged, never forgave him. Never trying to justify or explain or defend himself. A great great somebody who made the choice to be God's nobody. What a story. Zephaniah 3.11 In that day you will feel no shame because of all your deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proud exalting ones. And you will never again be haughty on my holy mountain. But I will leave among you a humble and lowly people. And they will take refuge in the name of the Lord. Amen. Let's stand and pray. God, forgive us, we pray, for every manifestation, every yielding to that horrible, boastful pride of life. And deliver us, Lord, from those ruts and those patterns of behavior where we just react and respond and speak out of that boastful pride of life. And give us the grace, Lord. Yes, you say over and over again in your word, humble yourselves, humble yourselves, humble yourselves. But we do also, Lord, pray for the grace and the working of your Holy Spirit to enable us to fully, properly do that. And we really do pray that there would be found here a people of lowly, Humble spirits, Lord. And that we can truly be your body as it ought to be. And so, Lord, I just pray that you work these things in us. You, you remind us. You jog us. You nudge us. And just remind us of a call to humble ourselves before you. And walk every day, every moment of every day, in that humility. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Amen.